I'm Tom. If can I add my welcome to you as well. Um, I'm going to speak today on this topic of faith, fear, and COVID-19. Faith, fear, and COVID-19. Using this one. Can you hear me? Could you hear me before? Okay, that's good. Um, so we, we, of course, will all know what the rules are, what the advice is if we have to deal with the coronavirus. We wash our hands, we sing the national anthem as we're doing so, with soap and hot water, social distancing. It's been extremely challenging not to try and shake people's hands. I'm trying. Uh, and then self-isolation if necessary, but uh, it raises, doesn't it, these kind of things, it's unprecedented, isn't it unprecedented? We kind of look at this and think, this is just totally different for so much of society. Have we been in this place before where so much is so different? Uh, and I think it raises a question, not just on the very specific practical things we can do, but on a wider level, how do we respond to things like this? And how do we, if we follow Jesus, how do we deal with challenge and trial? Challenge and trial. How do we have faith and not fear? Many churches, and again we've heard today, the biblical call to, to not be afraid, but to have faith. But the question is, well, how? How? How do we do that? Barna which is an organization which do a lot of research, statistical research on faith and many other issues. And this year, just in September, they published a report called Faith for Exiles. And what they did is they, were, they spent time uh, meeting with many young people who'd grown up in Christian homes. People who'd grown up in Christian homes, young people, and they, they, they found out where they were at with their faith. And just in Sept this September 2019, uh, they, they, they labelled some people as resilient disciples, resilient disciples, which means people who grew up in a Christian home and they now, even in the midst of trial and challenge, they're still going strong with Jesus. And they worked out the percentage of people who'd grown up in Christian homes who were resilient disciples. And it makes for very sobering reading. In much of Asia, this isn't only people who are still attending church, there's a much higher percentage of that. It's not people who still pray, but people who are resilient, like thriving in the midst of trial. In Asia, they found the percentage of young people who are resilient disciples was 25%. 25% of people who'd grown up in Christian homes had this resilience in their discipleship. In the UK, the percentage is 4%. 4%. And I think one of the major questions that we have to deal with is, how do we ha what do we mean when we say have faith, not fear? And how do we have faith, not fear, when we come up against challenges? Only that understanding is going to make us resilient as disciples. So I think what happens so often is when we hear the message, you know, we need to push into faith, guys. Have faith, have faith. What we actually find ourselves doing is, a, is having a fake faith. A fake faith faith. When we're speaking to other people who are Christians, we'll be like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm doing really well. I'm not worried about anything. In fact, you know, in the name of Jesus, I'm doing great. And, it, and, and what happens is so often people look at that and they think it's fake. And it kind of is a bit fake, isn't it? If it's not what's really going on. And uh, I just saw a good friend of ours, Neil and Kate Woodward, they sent us to Croydon, pastors of South West London Vineyard Church. And he said, so again, he's just somebody who's praying for him and he's long running issues. I won't get into all the details. And as somebody who's praying for him and saying, just in the name of Jesus right now, they're not there. They're not there, are they? And he's like, but they are there. But they are there. And they're like, no, they're not there. And it's like this, this encouragement. It, does faith mean we have to be fake? We have to pretend something's real that isn't real? It's kind of people look at it and think, well, how does that make sense in this world? Somebody dies, somebody gets sick, and it's like, well, where's faith now? It just seems fake. We don't want to have a fake faith. Equally, we don't want a fantasy faith, a fantasy faith that just pretends God will do whatever we want to do and snap our fingers. We want to have a fruitful 
faith. This is what it is to be a resilient disciple, to have fruitful faith. That in the midst of a challenge, in the midst of a crisis, when you're going through difficult times in your life, that something is still within you that is bearing fruit to Jesus Christ. There's something that people look at and think, wow, this person's living it. And unfortunately, it wasn't recorded by us. But last Sunday evening, uh, Duncan, who's recently been diagnosed with terminal cancer from a medical perspective, who knows what's going to happen, fighting it on a medical perspective, he stood up in front of everyone and said, but, you know, Jesus is great. And I worship him. And that's a resilient faith. This is fruitful faith in the midst of trial. So how do we have fruitful faith in the midst of COVID-19 crisis and understandable fear? Let's have a look at John chapter 13, verses 19 to 28. John chapter 13, verses 19 to 28. Excuse me, 18 to, 20, uh, 18 to 28 we're going to look at. You may want to look it up. I'm not sure if it will come up. It might do. Jesus has gathered the disciples in the upper room. In the other Gospels, we know that they're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We don't get that in John, but we know this is the room where this is happening. And actually, he says this. He says, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit, and he testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant, one of them, The disciple who Jesus loved was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As as, As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you're about to do, do quickly. Jesus told him, but no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. I want to say three things that happen, that psychologists say happen in anybody when you you receive a piece of disturbing news, something that God has built into the process of every human being. And the three phases are, first of all, alarm. The second is activation. And the third is recovery. Your body has been created by God. If you deal with a shock, a moment of fear, a moment of surprise, something you don't expect to happen, your body naturally has an alarm system that goes off. And it then activates your body to work in certain ways. It produces adrenaline, and the adrenaline enables your body to deal with this situation which is coming up in front of you. After the activation, you then have a recovery process which kicks in. So we see in this upper room, this system working. The first thing that Jesus says, he drops in the news, one of you is going to betray me. And you look at the disciples, and it's like this is an alarm, right? This is an alarm. Something's going on, Jesus has suddenly dropped in, they're sitting around having a nice meal, and the alarm has been set off. And so something happens in the disciples They're activated, the body is activated, the brain hears the news and they're like, I don't know what to do with this. And so they start pumping adrenaline through their body. And it says in the text, they stare at each other. A a loss. What earth is, what is this? And then recovery, we see Peter motions to John and says, hey, find out, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? Alarm, activation and recovery. Say that back to me, alarm. Activation, recovery. Unless we understand this, we can't understand what it is to push into faith instead of fear. Now, alarm. COVID-19, all the stuff that's going on in the news, the reality of the world at the moment, this is an alarm moment for our world. It's an alarm moment. There's a legitimate requirement for us to hear it and think, wow, what is this? What is this? It's an alarm thing going off. The way we've been doing life as a world... There's, there's a threat to it. It's an alarm moment. And we've got to understand that an alarm moment is, is 
totally within the realm of, of good, healthy, fruit, fruitful faith. Jesus himself, it says in verse 21, is troubled in spirit. And then he says, one of you will betray me. Do you understand? In this verse, Jesus legitimizes the reality of an alarm moment in our lives. Alarm moments should be embraced and understood. There's a reality that there's threat, there's challenge, there's things that make you feel stressed, and your body naturally has been designed by God to have an alarm system go off. And as we see what's going on, we see alarm is part of God's plan. And I'll tell you, you can see this also when Jesus, you know the story in the Gospels where, where Jesus is like, who does everyone say I am? And then Peter's like, oh, you're the rock. You're the Messiah. Sorry, he says, you're the Messiah. And then and Jesus says, oh, you're the rock on which his faith is going to be built. And then he starts to explain, and by the way, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. And Peter's like, alarm, that, that alarm's going off in my head. I want to shut this down, Jesus. This shouldn't have place in faith. It should only be good, positive, upbeat news. And he wants to shut it down. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, that's like of Satan. You've only got in mind the things of God, of, of man, not the things of God. And so alarm, we should embrace the fact that there's an alarm system in our bodies and in our minds. And that activates, activation is the second phase, it's a chemical reaction, you know this, adrenaline produces fight or flight. And so you see this happening at the moment, don't you? As people hear the news about the coronavirus, people start to act out of their adrenaline. Some people just rush to the shops. Did you see on Sunday, Saturday morning, I was doing park run at um, Roundshaw Downs by Costco. I don't know if anybody was there. I just arrived at quarter to nine in the morning. It op opens its doors at nine o'clock, and there were probably 3,000 people queued outside Costco waiting for the doors to open. It's the alarm system. It's like they're all the way along the whole of the car park, all the way down into the industrial estate. It's, I mean, this is, just the, this is just natural activation of the adrenaline. Like, I need to do something. Fight or flight. And you see in this passage that the disciples will stare at each other at a loss as to know what to do. And what happens when your adrenaline kicks in, it produces in you, do I fight or do I flight? Do I attack? Do I actively take some serious action right now or do I run away? And the reality is, again, for a fruit-filled faith, you need to know that sometimes your adrenaline causes you to do something to fight, which is positive and good. So you see in Pentecost, there's a reality of all these people are going crazy and everyone's like they're drunk, it's insane. And Peter in this moment, his alarm system's going off, something needs to be done. He steps up and says, let me explain to you all what's going on right now. And he preaches a sermon that sees 3,000 people come to faith. You see that, the activation. But equally, Peter, you see the other side of the coin, just a few hours maybe later in this story when they go into the garden and... Peter's got his sword and they start to arrest Jesus and he grabs it and his adrenaline is pumping and he chops the guy's ear off. And Jesus is like, what are you doing? But both of those are an outworking. Can you see of the fight impulse that the adrenaline generates? Or running away. A running away impulse. The flight impulse. You see, we see Jonah, don't we, where he runs away. And we know it's a bad thing. But then we see when Stephen's martyred in the book of Acts, and all the, all the disciples are like, oh, we can't live here, and they flee. And it's a great thing that God uses. So you've got to understand that this fight or flight is a natural thing that we have to process and work out. Like, how do we, what do we do? It's an activation. The adrenaline is sometimes producing really great responses from us, and other times, bad responses from us. But it's just part of the process. This is what it is. When you think about these things as believers, are you with me? Are you with me? We can't just be like, oh, faith. If we push into faith, we just forget about all this stuff. Think about this stuff. The more that you do the next phase, the better you will get at the activation phase being a holy activation a righteous activation, a spirit-filled activation rather than something of the flesh. And the third phase, as you already know, after alarm, after activation is 
recovery, recovery phase. And I've got to tell you, I think this is seriously a word from the Lord. This is what he is doing in his church and in his world through this terrible virus. This is the thing. Listen to this, because this is important. The recovery phase is essential. It's essential to live a life that's truly free from fear and is a life of faith. Truly. It's not fake. It's not fantasy. It's fruitful. This is what Dr. Arch Hart, who's, who's set up international Christian counselors, psycho, psychotherapists, psychologists uh, from South Africa, sp- spent a lot of his time at Fuller Theological Seminary in California. He says this, and this is in 1995, right? So this is 25 years ago. He says, gone is the leisurely, slow-paced way of life that once existed. We no longer have much time for contemplation. More important, we no longer have time to allow our bodies to relax so that restoration and healing can take place. In past times without electricity, evenings were calm and unstimulated, allowing the adrenaline system to switch off. But today there is hardly a moment where we are, when we are not bombarded with stimuli. From the moment we wake up until exhausted, we, we, switch, up, we switch off late night television. The toll of our fast-paced life takes on adrenal systems is quite frightening. Now what he's saying here is this. We have embraced, all of us, a way of life that wants to constantly go from alarm to activation, back to alarm to activation, back to alarm back to activation. And we never embrace the recovery phase that God has designed for us to truly live fruitful lives, free from fear, living in fear, living in faith. It's like this. It's like God's designed your body and your, your inner workings. That sometimes adrenaline kicks in, alarm goes off, and it stretches. And you know you can sometimes do things, and you have energy levels. If you just had a baby or you've just seen something terrible happen, you can respond, and your energy levels go up. And then what God's designed it is it goes back down again and you just have space and recovery. But what we've done with smartphones, with constantly checking the news, with constantly always on culture, is we're just constantly stretched. We're constantly stretched. And the truth is that this isn't a fruitful way to live. This isn't a life that's ultimately free from fear because you're constantly in fear. You're constantly stimulated. You're constantly, your alarm system's going off. And not only does that create problems for you physically, the, the number of heart attacks in our country this year will probably be 42,000, just from stress, from over. The number of hours and uh, days of working days through to anxiety and stress and trouble is, I think, something like 10.4 million just in our country. We're living a life where we've just totally, we've shown a red card to God's idea of Sabbath and recovery. And what it's doing is killing our ability to live fruitful lives. I remember as I was, when I I was around about 17 years old, I became a Christian around about 15, 16. I remember starting looking for guys further on than me who I could like, I could, I could follow, I could apprentice myself to, I could learn from. It's a great thing to do. If you're a new Christian, just look for people and you think, I want to follow them, I want to be like them. I remember there was this one guy, I'm not going to tell you his name, but I looked at him and he was so impressive. He always would have somebody who wasn't a Christian he'd be meeting with and he'd be bringing them along. He, he used to just play squash with people and do all kinds of stuff and he used to take me on board and loads of time. Impressive, so impressive. But if I'm really honest, the more I looked, the closer I got, the more I found there was no recovery space in his life. And, and actually, to be honest, if I'm really honest, some of, some of at the core of what he was living, it looked a bit empty. Sometimes he'd respond to people with a cutting remark. Sometimes he'd react to situations with just, come on, let's drive this forward. And I began to think, I don't know if I want that for my life. And I remember I just looked at my granddad, and in many ways he wasn't a particularly impressive man. But I just remember seeing that over and over again he'd just make space in his life for meditating on God. And he just used to over and over again be like, you know, like, let's, let's just clear our mind and just be open to Jesus. And I, I tell you, the closer I got to him, 
the more attractive it looked. He responded with such kindness and gentleness. And I think it was like in that moment I, I, be, I began to see like the reality is that if I don't begin to build this recovery phase into my life, I'm going to end up as a disciple that I don't want to be. Have you ever had that moment? Have you ever had that moment? So how do we do this recovery phase? How do we get into our lives a positive, fruitful faith? Well, number one is rest. It's just rest. And listen, you might not be a Christian. You might be here trying to work out, what's Jesus got to say to me? Well, do you know one of the main things he says is rest. And I honestly ask you, do you ever rest? Do you ever rest? So Jesus said one day, I mean, God right from the beginning said one day out of seven, take a Sabbath. Now, it's kind of, I'm not going to be really hard on that, but I want to ask you, do you ever rest? Do you ever replenish? And I, I increasingly find I have to. So, so now it's my hope and my goal most weeks at four o'clock on a Friday, four o'clock p.m. on a Friday, through to six o'clock on a Sunday morning, I don't go near my phone. I try. I try. So yesterday I checked my phone because I was like, who knows what the government's going to say latest minute about this stuff and can we still meet today and all that kind of stuff. But generally it's like a, it's a principle for me. I wanted to have hours away from it because every time I scroll onto the news, it sets off alarm systems in my brain, especially when it has breaking news, bright le- yellow, flashing. Serious, doesn't it? And I tell you, you need to build rest into your life. Build a pattern of rest. Be careful about what you do in your evenings. If you're last minute, you know, like, I was teaching this to our kids, like, over and over again, like, you you have to have an hour of no screens before you go to bed. Like, can I not just check this? No! You have to be be rigorous with yourself to build rest, because we don't do it naturally. Be rigorous with your rest. But if you're a follower of Jesus, I want to tell you this. Recline on your Redeemer. Recline on your Redeemer. Recline on your Redeemer. This is what it means. Do you know that what happens in the upper room, what you see? Jesus is like, one of you is going to betray me. Alarm system goes off. Activation, they all start looking around that. They're all like, who's going to, who, is it going to be you? Who's it going to be? And they're all looking around the room like this. And then, and then Peter, it says, Peter, he motions to John, we think it's John. He motions to John. So it's all like this. And Peter's like that. Ask him, ask him. Ask him, ask him. And John's like, what? You know, they're all, like, ask him. Who, who? So John, what does John do? Did you read it? Did you catch it? What does John do? He reclines on his Redeemer. Jesus, which one is it going to be? Which one's it going to be? Everybody else in that activation, they're just staring. It's probably going to be him. <laughs> Isn't it? I, I saw, he wanted to call down fire on those Samaritan villages. It's going to be him for sure. But John reclines on his Redeemer. He gets this alarm system, goes off. He begins to activate. And he's like, no, I want to use this to make me lean into leaning on Jesus. He reclines on his Redeemer. If it was me or you, probably, we'd have been like, one of us is going to betray him. Right, there must be a website. Who's most likely to betray? Let's have a little look. Let's check the news. Let's check the news. Oh, oh, Judas has left the Judas has left the house. It's probably oh, breaking news. Don't we do that? You see, there's something about just reclining on your redeemer which brings recovery into your system. Now let me tell you the reality of reclining on your Redeemer, just the science of it is that as your adrenaline in your system starts to, as you start to recline and recover, the adrenaline starts to fade back. 
starts to fade back. And as the adrenaline in your system starts to fade back, actually what it does is it makes you feel downbeat. It makes you feel downbeat. So as you start to recover, you actually start to feel lower than you did when the adrenaline is pumping through your system. It's just scientifically the, the case, right? So what we do, what we do is this. As soon as we start to feel a little bit downbeat, because actually the Lord's making space in our lives. He's deliberately wanting there to be space. He's deliberately wanting us to feel a bit bored, to feel a bit low, because that's just that's part of the recovery process. He's designed for us. But as soon as we start to feel bored or a little bit low, we think, oh, let's have another little check. Let's just have another little check at the news. What's going on? Oh, there's more breaking news. And we just keep on pushing ourselves back into the alarm. Because we, want our, we get an addiction to the adrenaline running through our system. If you're somebody, when you go on, if you ever take a holiday, if you never take a holiday, you're addicted to adrenaline, right? Number one. If, you, if when you take a holiday, if it takes you a few days to get into a holiday, that's me. Anybody else like that? You're like, it takes me two or three days. Almost certainly you're addicted to adrenaline. Scientifically, that's what it says. Because you've just been running on adrenaline all the time, and then finally you try and stop, and the first day on holiday, you know, Leslie would be like, oh, isn't this a nice holiday? And like, no, it's not. What am I going to do? <laughs> and I have to start finding things to do. And it takes me a couple of days, and then I'll be like, oh, I'm, re I'm finally relaxed for the first time in months. It's a sign. It's a sign because what we do is when we start to feel downbeat, we want to kick back into adrenaline. And Jesus' encouragement is, so let it happen, just let that downbeat thing go. Do you notice what Jesus does when they say, who's going to betray him? I mean, he could have been like, Judas. But he doesn't, does he? Because what Jesus does is he's, he just so often will, will kind of be slightly obscure with us. Do you notice what he does? You're like, Jesus, which one is it? And he's like, I'm going to take a piece of bread. I'm going to dip it in the dish. And the person I give it to, they're going to be the one. What does that make you do? It either makes you think, well, forget that. Or you watch every single thing that Jesus does. Is he getting the bread yet? Is that bread in his hand right now? It looks like he's dipping it. Is he dipping? Yeah, he's dipping it. Who's he going to give this to? And I don't know about you, but I think, I think Jesus maybe did a bit of this. Pretends to give it to somebody. <laughs> Pretends to give it to Peter. Oh, no. You see, Jesus wants relationship with you. Re reclining on your Redeemer is what he wants for you, and we're so prone to running away from that. He has to be obscure with us. He has to kind of almost be speaking riddles to us to make us give him the attention that we need to give him so we can recover. So sometimes there's just so many distractions that make us stop reclining on our Redeemer. Have you ever tried to pray? And you're like, suddenly like, oh, I just need to do the washing. Like never before in my life have I ever needed to do the washing. But right now, I've just remembered I have to do the washing. You ever done that? Distractions. Oh, I've just remembered I need to send that person that message. If I don't send that person that message in the next five minutes, the world's going to end. He's like, no, just, just get rid of your distractions. Recline on your Redeemer. Downbeat feelings, oh, this is boring, I don't like this, this is rubbish. Tom said, Tom made out this was going to be better than this. I'm not doing it anymore. Just reclining your Redeemer. It takes time to get through the boredom and the sense of difficulty because that's just all part of you processing. It's the dust settling in your life and your soul. And then when it's settled, you're like, there's a purity and a beauty and a joy and a wonder to it. It just, you've got to give it that space. But another reality is it's just not taught. Most of us have just never been taught how to recline on a Redeemer. You've probably never seen anybody do it. You've probably never been told this is how you do this stuff. I remember when I first came into the vineyard, I used to hear about this guy called John Wimber who started the vineyard movement. And people just used to go on and on about him sitting in his Lazy Boy. Now, I don't know about if you know, a Lazy Boy is an American make of armchair off their recliners. Often they're recliners. And she used to say, just John Wimber, who is this, in my mind, this amazing apostle, therefore he must have constantly been always busy. He said he used to sit in his lazy boy for four hours. 
And people are like, well, what are you doing? Oh, you know. He just built a pace into his life that just allowed him to recline on his Redeemer. It says that in the mornings when he got up, he just used to play his piano. He was a brilliant musician. He worked with the Righteous Brothers and was a fantastic musician. He used to play songs on his piano for an hour every morning. And his wife, Carol Wimber, said that some of the songs that he played then, she'd be like, oh, who wrote that? Where's that? That's the greatest worship song I've ever heard. And he'd be like, oh, that's, that's mine. And she'd be like, you need to release that. And he'd be like, no, that one's just for Jesus. That's just for me and Jesus. He taught his people how to recline on the Redeemer. And are we doing it? And are we teaching people how to do it? If you notice the way that Jesus himself has reclined on his Redeemer, his Father, is that he's used the Psalms. He quotes Psalm 41. And I want to really encourage you to recline on your Redeemer. You want to reflect on a text. You, when you, when you've had, you know there's an adrenaline system's gone through, you've had an activation, you want to just look at a text and be like, Lord, just speak to me. What was going on there? Let me just look at this with you. Reflect on a text. Don't just sort of randomly Google answers or no, get on a text. Get in the book. You get, you get calm with a psalm. You'll remember it now, won't you? You get calm with a psalm. Serious. This is how you do it. Just slowly read through a psalm and, until you get calm. That's how you recline on your Redeemer. This is how you do it. Just, it's just, yesterday, I, you know, I just, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I find this quite challenging trying to work out how do you lead a, a church through this kind of time like this where so many people's jobs are in peril and so much of what's normal is gone and what's the, every hour it seems like something new is being said about some part of the world. I find this hard and I was like, I need to get some, I need to recline on my Redeemer. So I just sat down and just started reading through Psalm 9. It could be any psalm, but just reading through Psalm 9. Like, I want to get calm with the psalm. I want to reflect on the text. God, what, what's going on here? Just found in Psalm 9, there's a thing that Jesus, I'm just going to read a couple of bits of it to you, just to illustrate this is, to me, this is how it is. This isn't particularly profound, but it's just how it was. But in Psalm 9, just from verse 6, it says, Endless ruin has overtaken the enemy. You have, you have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. To those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. And as I just read that, I was like, oh, Spirit of God, please lead me to process with this passage. Help me to get calm with this psalm. Help me to reflect through this text. Cities have always found themselves from prospering and flourishing to suddenly being in ruin. All through history, the run of civilizations, there's always been things have come in that have suddenly stilled and quieted and stopped. And as I read that, I was just like, Lord, is this something where you're just actually imposing some Sabbath on this earth that's been lost? Have you seen the stuff about pollution and redu reduction and some of that? And you like, is this something here you're doing, Lord? I, I want to see your hand in all of this but you're a stronghold in the time of trouble. You've never, you've never forsaken those who seek you, and I seek you in this midst, and I want to encourage the people to seek you in this midst. You've never forsaken us. And I think of the cross, and I think of the resurrection, and I think of how even if we die, we will be raised with him. And it's like this moment of like reflecting on the text and processing in the passage, and I speak out my fears and my concerns and my worries, and some crazy theories that then fall to nothing, and some other theories that are unexpected, and they just come out of the 
the passage. And I was like, wow. And then the Lord is like, but I will sing praises to the Lord among the nations. And I realized that actually the call on my life in this moment is will I praise him? Will I sing praise to his greatness, to his glory and his wonder? Will that be my priority, my primacy? Will I just be here to say how awesome Jesus is? Because that's the, what the passage, that's what the psalm is telling me I should do. And I begin to get calm with that. Well, I can do that. I don't know how to make all these decisions. I don't know what to tell everyone what to do, but I do know I can praise my Redeemer. I can say how great God is. I can say he sits enthroned in the heavens, that Jesus has conquered death, and he's now with the Father, and he's been kind to me through my whole life. I can do that. Fruitful faith, not fake faith. Not fantasy faith, but fruitful faith embraces that there's alarm and activation and lives for recovery, reclining on the Redeemer. And you need to build that into your life, especially at this time. Build that space. Recovery. And at the end of this whole chapter of 13, Jesus then begins chapter 14, which says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. And what he's saying is not never have alarm. He's not saying never have activation. What he's saying is build your life so the pattern of your life leads you constantly into recovery where you can recline on your Redeemer and you end up trusting in God. So, we have a God who can actually forge in all of us fruitful faith if we let him, if we recline on him. And I want that for you. So should we pray? Ask the Lord to come and meet with us and move among us. And if you're on live stream, then you can just pray where you're at home. That's encourage you. Don't check out now. This is the really good bit. So Spirit of the living God, Would you come and fall afresh? Would you come and fall afresh on us now? And even right now, lead us into that place of reclining on you, our Redeemer. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord God. Ask for your peace to come and reign. We're just going to wait in the stillness. Increase your presence here, God. Increase your presence here, God. Just want to invite you as you're sitting with the Lord, just... Ask him what's one thing you can do to build more recovery into your life this week. Come, Lord God. Come, Lord God. As we've sat with the Lord, I think it's just a time for a moment of honesty for some of us. You might find this helpful or not, but just, we just want to gauge where am I at with fear and with stress. You know, if I'm really honest before you, Lord, and just gauge that from five would be, I'm, uh, if I'm really honest, I'm living this all the time, through to one, I, I, it's just so, I feel like I'm thriving in it, and calm Lord Jesus, I just pray for a moment of revelation, and of vulnerability, just before the Lord, you just confess, this is where I'm at with this Lord, and as you, as you bring it into the light, the Lord begins to bring healing, and hope, and peace, just begin to lay down before him, Some of the practices and the habits you have that you feel he's calling you to change, just lay them down before him. Come, Lord God. Come, Lord God. I'm just convinced for some of you the word of the Lord is he wants you to be long-term fruitful. And that means there's times of rest. There's times of rest. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and do your work.